Ready? Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning to talk to you a little bit about my story with Black Girls Code. I'm the founder and executive director of Black Girls Code, which is a nonprofit organization that really teaches, focuses on teaching girls from underrepresented communities how to embrace the technology industry as founders and creators. And I'm really excited to be joined this morning with my, by my daughter Kai, who was the motivating um, person for me in terms of really getting this organization started and, and seeded and off the ground. And so we're both gonna share a little bit about our collective stories and our personal stories and tell you a bit about when that moment was that we knew that this was the path that we should be on. So starting with me, um, if you see on the screen now, that little girl in those pigtails and those very, very, very girly dress is me, that circa 1970s. Um, my upbringing as a girl um, was very different than my daughter's. Um, I had an older brother, but for me, you know, my mom and my family really thought that my world revolved around everything pink, everything frilly, Barbie dolls, you know, everything that was traditionally thought to be what girls would do and girls would focus on. However, I really was more interested in that picture that you see there, that science kit, that engineering focus and exploration, which were things that my brother was introduced to, but not me, uh, because there were very traditional gender roles in our family, and even though I had just as much interest in science and technology and engineering, that was not what it was expected for me to pursue. Um, so flash forward about 30 years, and my daughter's experience comes into play, which was very different than my own. So for me, uh, that's the little girl that you see up there, but I was into ballet at that age. But besides that, I was kind of a tomboy, which um, was a little bit <laughs> kind of like, it was weird to my mom since she is the kind of girly upbringing, but I'd always been into video games since I was really young. Like before I even started playing like consoles and like handhelds, I was always just playing like Leap Start and all those like uh, generic like little kid uh, PC games at my house. But as I started to grow, I started getting more into technology through gaming, but I didn't really know if that was a career path, because all I really knew back then was video game tester. I just wanted to be a video game tester because I love playing video games and the thought I could get paid to play video games, that seemed like a, a good career for me. But over that summer of fifth grade year when I was um, 10 years old, my mom enrolled me at this camp at Stanford where we basically build our own platformer game in the course of a week. And by the end of the week, I created my own game and I was so proud of myself because I would coded it all by myself and I was at the top of my class and I came home to my mom and I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't want to be a video game tester. Like, I love playing video games, but what makes me even happier is creating things for myself and building things from the ground up so I can create the kind of games that I want to play. So it was that summer, actually, that our paths came together. So whereas that was the moment that Kai realized through this summer experience that she really wanted to dive into the tech industry as a computer programmer, it was also an awakening moment for me. So we're 30 years past the time I went to school and graduated from college with a degree in electrical engineering, but what surprised me most, most about her experience was that her summer camp class looked just like my freshman first year engineering CS 101. So 30 years later, the class was literally still filled with boys, sprinkled with a handful of girls, and almost no students of color. And I can tell you that driving home that day from bringing Kai from camp was the moment that she told me that she felt alone and isolated in that class and that sometimes her instructors didn't really pay as much attention to the girls that I knew that my path would change forever and that I would create an opportunity to create an easier and perhaps a more supportive environment for my daughter if she was going to follow in my footsteps as a woman of color in the field of engineering. And so that started us on this path to addressing this problem. Do you see it there? 
So the problem we're trying to address is this. Women and girls of color are left out of the tech industry and highly underrepresented in this burgeoning field of technology. When you look here on this particular graph, it shows the number of women from about the early 1966-67, which I was born in, so now you can figure out how quite old I am. But the peak there is when I actually graduated from college in 1989. That was a peak moment for women in computer science. But as you see all the other hard science fields, the numbers increase for women, that is not the case for computer science. There's actually about 36% or so women that receive CS degrees in computer science when I graduated in 1989. They're now less than 18%. This is the problem that we wanted to solve with Black Girls Code. When we created this organization in 2011, it was really just me taking my desire as a mom to create an opportunity for my daughter to pursue her passion in a creative environment that would give her the support that she needed and also put her in a room with other geeky girls that shared her interests and her desires and passions around technology. So we work across the spectrum with girls as young as seven to girls as old as 17. One of the things that we found as we started the organization and we looked at the numbers was quite surprising. So when we talked to people about why this issue of lack of diversity in the industry was an issue, they said a lot of things like, oh, girls don't do gaming, which I knew was incorrect because I was at GameStop every single weekend with my daughter um, buying the next and newest game after she played one and reached all the levels. Or they said girls were just not interested in technology. So some of the studies that we saw that's represented here shows that up to about middle school, girls are overly indexed to their peers in terms of being interested in pursuing technology as a career field. It's when they get to high school that that number drops off drastically to less than 3%, which leads us to what we see in the pie chart with less than 18% of women overall receiving a bachelor's degree in CS, and for black women and Latinas, that number falls off a cliff. It's only about 3% of African-American women that receive a bachelor's degree in CS, and that number is less than 1% for women that are Hispanic. What we wanted to do with the organization was really to change that dynamic, address it directly by creating programs with a mission to give girls of color an opportunity to become the leaders in technology. Our vision is to reach a million girls by the year 2040 and become the de facto Girl Scouts of technology. Um, our program started, as I mentioned, back in 2011, when this educational field that we were talking around, youth and coding, was really just getting a start. Some of these organizations that you see here were some of the organizations that started or were in, in place by the time we started Black Girls Code, but we were the only one with a similar focus on girls from underrepresented communities. Our program focuses on introducing these girls from everything to VR, mobile app development, game design, robotics, all in an after-school program that allows them to not only learn the rudimentary skills of coding and technology, but also to use their creative energies to really create company ideas and develop an entrepreneurial passion that will allow them to enter the field not just as employees, but also as creators. This just shows some of the classes that we've done with girls across the US. When we started, we were a grassroots organization with just a little bit of maybe like six girls in your first class, one being my daughter. And now we've seen the organization grow to reach over 7,000 girls to date. We have chapters in 13 cities in the US as well as in Johannesburg, South Africa. The few things that we learned along the way are the, th the key things that I wanted to leave with you today in particular. Um, and these are things that I think are not only relevant to folks that are doing mission-driven work like Black Girls Code, but if you're creating a company of your own. And we wanted to end by speaking to some of those things that we've learned with Black Girls Code. The first is to have a reckless disregard for the impossible. 
And I say this with all honesty, because when we started in 2011, we had no sponsors behind us. We were lucky to the theme of this conference to find a computer lab in a small basement in Baby Hunters Point in San Francisco that had six computers. And our goal was to reach six girls. Now, how we ended up in this lab and finding this lab in the middle of San Francisco is truly luck. Um, but we had a vision that was much, much greater than just those six computers in that basement. So our goal was to really create not just an organization um, that was going to see my daughter and her friends that were interested in, in computers and coding, but actually to create a movement and a conversation around the importance of diversity and inclusion in our tech industry. This picture I love to show because it shows just one of our classes. Um, this is in Berkeley in San Francisco or in the Bay Area in Berkeley, California, our Robotics Expo where we have annually more than 300 students that come together in a course of a Saturday to learn about robotics. And this is one of those group pictures that we took in that. So if you would ask me, I think, uh, in 2011 or ask other people, could we go from a six computer basement to this? It is one city, one city. We have 13 cities. No one would have believed that. But having a reckless re disregard for what was possible allowed us to achieve much more than anyone thought we could at the beginning. Did you find that in your experience too? I think um, just like you kind of spoke to um, kind of overcoming the impossible, I thought more that kind of spoke to my experience was overcoming the self because um, as I was growing and I was learning what I kind of want, <clears throat> wanted to be in the future and how my dreams, I wanted my dreams to come true, I, f I found out that everybody else was kind of cheering me on and like trying to um, help me and they saw like this path for me and they saw how that I could create something big and be a creator but I was standing in uh, my own path and I was kind of keeping myself from reaching my full potential. And that's how I kind of realized that I could be my own biggest adversary and that I had to overcome myself and my own fears before I could kind of really begin to become who I wanted to be. The next thing that we both felt was a really relevant topic for us was being able to envision the future. Um, for this one, I use this picture here uh, that is my daughter, Kai, who's here with me, and two other students. Um, this is them speaking at the Lean Startup Conference back in 2013 when um, none of the girls on the stage, they were, two of them are only 13 years old, one is 10. And they were talking about an application that they built over the course of their very first hackathon called Feed Me. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so around that time, we'd gone to a hackathon in the Oakland area, and we basically just sat down, and we were kind of brainstorming what kind of issues were prevailing in our own communities. And one thing that keep, kept coming up was this homelessness and how these people under the poverty line and on the streets don't have access to food, and we wanted to kind of create some kind of way that with an app, we could change that. So we created this um, app called Feed Me, which was basically trying to pair people who are homeless and under the poverty line to shelters um, so where they could get food. So basically, restaurants at the end of the day would go to the shelters and give them their surplus of food. And uh, it would kind of work as, I don't know if you know Instacart like that, but um, it kind of works like that where people were able to see kind of what was available to them and were able to go to their local shelter so they could pick up food and not end up hungry at the end of the day. So part of the, the future work that Black Girls Go focuses on is giving girls not just an opportunity to learn how to code, but to use coding as a tool for changing the world around them. Most of the activities that they're doing are focused on a social change issue in their communities. And we look at this future task that's here, or this future list here, headline here, is that we hope that in 20 years, in 10 years, in 30 years, these girls will become the change agents in our communities that are really getting their start with learning the rudimentary parts of coding through Black Girls Code, but using technology not 
just as a tool for their own personal success, but for changing issues within the world. The final really um, salient point that we wanted to focus on here was the, oper the importance of embracing your moment. As we started out in this talk, one of the things that we wanted to really share was when was the moment that we knew that this was the path that we should be on. And I remember um, listening to some of the talks from earlier this week, and one of the speakers um, said a point that was somewhat around the um, point of that, if sometimes when you see your lucky moment is that you don't know when to act on it, or you may not recognize it. And for me, I think that is the key in terms of being able to utilize some of the opportunities that came our way, was knowing when that moment, that listening to Kai on the way from that summer camp talk about her experience, that was a moment for me to, to realize I needed to make a change if I wanted to see the change happen in my daughter's world. So it's not just about um, having luck Across our paths is being bold and audacious enough to step out on faith when your moment arises. In the black community, I always like to can create the culture in everything that we do. What we like to say is that if you stay ready, then you don't have to get ready. So that is something that I feel is very important for us as founders. It's always being ready to embrace the moment of inspiration, that moment of luck, and step out and create an active step to really embrace that moment and create the change that you want to see. What about for you? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I don't have anything to say to that. Yeah, I um, mean, yeah, I just need, I want to say that basically, just like with embrace your moment, just like there's many moments when uh, you'll like kind of find an idea that never occurred to you and, um, There'll be moments when you'll think of something that you'll think that nobody else has uh, kind of come across, and you'll be astounded that like you may have kind of made a breakthrough. And I think that's really important, like my mom's saying, to embrace that point of like courage, just bold courageousness, where you're able to like actually act on something that you're really passionate about. Well, for us, I think. The, the final thought here is really um, not just a story of Black Girls Code. I think it's the a, it's a story of any founder. You know, really creating for yourself and your team an opportunity to um, build community around your mission. Um, be bold enough to find folks in your community that are going to help you drive that mission. And then step out and create the change that you want to see in the world. Um, for us and for me, it's been five years now, and as I said, with Black Girls Code, we've reached over 7,000 girls. We are just launching our 13th chapter, which is in Detroit. Uh, we have really seen not only the organization drive a conversation around diversity and inclusion, we are seeing girls like my daughter and many of the other girls that started with our program back in 2012 start to take the reins and actually become the leaders that we never envisioned and we started in back you know, from the beginning. We were just trying to really create the next female Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> but now we see that not only could we possibly do that in the future, but we're actually building girls like the one here on the screen that's from our Johannesburg, South Africa chapter. Um, we're creating opportunities for these girls to change the world. And that's really what the work is all about. So thank, thank you for your time, and we hope that gives you some inspiration as founders. Mm -hmm.